So in the last lecture, we talked about how chloroplasts are used to harness energy from the sun and to convert it, or from light, and to convert it into um, usable energy by our body cells uh, in the form of NADPH and ATP. And we talked specifically about two different photosystems that are used, that are utilized to uh, collect this energy. In photosystem two, um, you are taking in the light uh, in the chlorophyll molecules to excite the electrons. Um, and then you are using water splitting enzyme that takes in water and uh, breaks it apart into oxygen as well as protons um, that are then used to create the proton gradient uh, within the thylakoid space as um, compared to the stroma, um, and the oxygen is released into the atmosphere. This proton gradient that is uh, generated is further enhanced as these molecules, these electrons, are transferred onto a plastoquinone molecule and go into a cytochrome B6 complex, um, which is kind of like the intermediate step in the electron transport chain, uh, which then rearranges it to create a plastocyanin releasing protons uh, into, again, the thylakoid space for use uh, in generation of ATP uh, through the ATP synthase. So again, the proton gradient is going to run the ATP synthase and generate that ATP. The plastocyanin that is produced is further utilized in photosystem 1 by the chlorophylls, which then, again, uh, use light energy to uh, you know, produce that change in reaction center to um, now use a different intermediate molecule, a different transfer molecule carrier of this electron energy. In the case of ferrodoxin, which binds to FNR or which interacts interacts with FNR and is utilized to uh, produce activated NADPH molecules, which are again um, essentially energy carriers. In this case, NADP plus ion and protons are is used to produce these NADPH. So the light energy that is harnessed at the end of the day by um, the cell is in the form of NADPH and ATP. So now we are going to shift our focus and look at how this energy is now used by the cell to produce macromolecules or to create macromolecules using carbon dioxide as their carbon source. Um, and this involves a process called carbon fixation, which actually includes making individual covalent bonds to produce these macromolecules or their intermediates, an example of which is being shown to you uh, right here in the form of carbon dioxide getting taken in. Um, it, it uses a ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate to uh, then get... Uh, converted into an intermediate uh, using Rubisco as an, um, the source to create this change. Um, and here you can see that actual bonds are being formed within this molecule to create that intermediate. And that that intermediate is hydrolyzed by water to create two molecules of free phosphoglycerate. And that is what is the product in this case from this carbon fixation cycle. The carbon fixation cycle um, is used to form organic molecules in use, utilizing carbon dioxide and water as your input. Now, this process requires a lot of energy as well. So throughout this cycle, um, it, you will actually end up using nine molecules of ATP. So it has a lot of energy requirement in addition to six molecules of NADPH. So utilizing all those molecules of ATP as well as NADPH, you end up with a net result of these um, generation of your um, uh, the glyceraldehyde uh, molecules you end up with this glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate that can then be utilized to create sugars, fats, or amino acids as needed. Now, the first part of the Calvin cycle or the carbon fixation cycle is used to create these uh, 
glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate molecules. And this is for the production, uh, this production requires 6 ATPs and 6 NADPH. The second half of the carbon fixation cycle, on the other hand, is focused on regeneration of that ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate needed for this process to occur again. And that process requires um, ADP, uh, three additional ATP molecules um, for that to run in itself. Um, the input in this case is three carbon dioxide molecules that are utilized for this reaction to run. So let's look at that uh, on where it is that these processes are happening and what is the result. So as the plants make this, uh, the, this glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, they are going to be using this molecule to create sugars uh, in the form of glucose, but they will also use them for fats and for amino acids. So throughout the chloroplast, you will actually see starch granules forming, which is their way to store this carbohydrate. And you will also see fat droplets forming, which is uh, where they are storing these fats that they are creating for energy consumption as well. So sugars that are produced in the plants um, have to be either stored or used up right away to make ATP. If you were using them for ATP production, they are going to go into the cytosol and then get converted into the same cycles as we've talked about before, where they're going to go to that through glycolysis in the cytosol for um, their pyruvates and then go into the mitochondria for citric acid cycle and then oxidative phosphorylation through the typical electron transport chain. On the other end, in the chloroplast, you are focusing on that NADPH and ATP production from the light reactions and then the carbon fixation cycles to produce these sugars and starch in the dark reactions or light independent reactions. Um, the sugars can also be used to be broken in the cytosol to get broken down into different metabolites that may be needed for glycolipids or glycoprotein formation. They can also be utilized in other parts of the cells for other functions, including DNA and RNA formation as well. So the evolution of these energy systems required a lot of different steps, right? This didn't happen overnight. As you can see, it is quite a complex system. So early organisms that were likely producing ATP um, through fermentation because you did not have enough atmospheric oxygen. Um, however, you would still have certain amounts of organic acids that would be present in the environment and that would be lowering that pH. And remember, fermentation gives you lactic acid as one of its products that would also be increasing um, the P, uh, lowering the pH of the environment as well. So in the first stage, the cells would have generated some type of this pump system to get all these protons out of the cells using ATP so the cell can still survive without lowering uh, of the P, physiological pH um, into the state where they can no longer survive. Um, so as you start to use up the nutrients from the environment and they're not getting uh, changed up, and as you are um, you know, shuttling these protons out of the system into the environment and lowering the pH, you have to at some point figure out a way to save your energy and also survive without having all this proton available there. And so in the second stage, possibly, what you ended up with happening was development somehow of these uh, pumps uh, to generate energy within the cell so that you are not utilizing all, that, all this ATP that you just made. You're not just using it to survive, to throw these protons out into the environment. So you started to save ATP by pumping protons from one place into the other with uh, into like specialized regions within the cell uh, to maintain the survival, to maintain the environment of the remaining cell. And that is probably where the electron transfer chain got developed over time 
especially as oxygen levels rose in the atmosphere and allowed uh, for its utilization for energy production and energy usage. Um, so cells likely developed efficient proton pumps and electron transport system in conjunction with atmospheric oxygen um, levels rising along with uh, you know the more sophistication of these organisms that were forming as a result and these efficient systems were now able to not only create atp at a much higher rate but also provided a internal system for control of this atp production so this would be a similar system to modern mitochondria maybe not as um, efficient or as advanced but similar to that so the oxidative phosphorylations uh, essentially would have evolved in several stages where in the initial stage the primitive cell all it did was it produced atp but then it had to throw out that uh, extra hydrogen ions the protons out into the atmosphere in order to survive and then over time they developed a system where they had an electron transport protein that pumped these protons out instead of utilizing ATP so that the ATP was not getting wasted on this process and could be utilized for the cell itself for its energy needs. And then finally, over uh, a longer period of time, and especially with the atmosphere oxygen levels rising, allowing for um, usage of oxygen by the cell for energy production and energy utilization, you would have developed a more sophisticated system where the protons were getting pumped with the usage of these electron uh, driven proteins and then um, the ADP, the proton pumps were getting utilized now, not just to work to throw the protons out, but also to bring them in when the gradient allowed that to happen allowing for its usage to generate ATP, to actually get more energy uh, in rather than to lose energy only. Um, so looking at these formation, it took billions of years. It didn't happen overnight. It didn't happen over a hundred years or a thousand years or 10,000, but over billions of years, where if you look at the first cell that is around uh, you know, 3.6 billion years ago, the first water splitting photosynthesis that releases oxygen didn't happen until, you know, 3 million years ago. So it's like half a million years, um, or several million years in between this, uh, just this one step. And then aerobic respiration becoming widespread didn't happen until rapid oxygen accumulation happened in the atmosphere allowing for these aerobic uh, organisms to be formed or allowing for those most sophisticated systems to be formed and that didn't happen until another billion and a half years later and so once oxygen uh, was enough in the atmosphere and aerobic respiration became widespread you did see the advent of eukaryotic cells and then multicellular plants at a much higher rate in a much shorter period of time so you were able to get a lot more variability in a, a shorter period of time, relatively shorter span of time. It's still one and a half billion year span. Um, then how things were happening earlier when for a long time there was this kind of quiescent state with just your very simple primitive cells, either photosynthetic or non-photosynthetic, um, and aerobic, mostly obviously anaerobic at that time, um, surviving unchanged for a very long time, just making these small changes over that period of time. Uh, and finally, you know, you have these anaerobic bacteria, and you have bacteria that live in all kinds of crazy environment in hot springs and in, you know, a very, very otherwise hostile environment. Well, these are able to use, still survive in those because they have these alternate interesting systems for electron donation and electron transfer. For example, photosynthesis in green sulfur bacteria 
uses hydrogen sulfide as an electron donor rather than water because that's not something they have easy access to. And this is something that is, again, that gives us idea on how those initial primitive creatures, primitive organisms and primitive cells would have survived in that hostile environment, even though they didn't have the amount of you know, oxygen available or the right temperature available or the right environment otherwise available to them. And this could be partly how our evolution started was because uh, or especially in the sense of metabolism because of its ability to utilize that hydrogen sulfide as an electron donor to charge a system to make some energy in the form of NADPH. Not as fun as ATP, but still an energy that it could utilize to survive. Um, and it's another one that you can look at is methanococcus, which um, again, it looks very much like something uh, that we probably saw very early in life's history because it is able to survive in hydrothermal vents in, again, really uh, high uh, temperature or use, uh, you know, in a very hostile environment where you don't normally see the same levels of oxygen and the same levels of uh, other agents that you need. And in this case, these deep sea archaea um, use hydrogen gas that bubbles through these winds as a way to reduce um, their chemo uh, chemiosmotic coupling uh, 